Hey everybody, welcome back to Evolutionary History here. We are going to be finishing up our final science unit um, starting chapter three today. We're going to be starting the first of three lessons that are going to wrap up this chapter. Um, so make sure you have got your pencil and a piece of paper as we get started. Um, go ahead and pause the video now. We're going to go over some important review concepts that I think are going to help you to kind of remember all of the hard work that you've done so far already throughout this unit um, and kind of ground our thinking so that when we move forward, um, we can activate some of our background knowledge to help us to process some new things that we're going to learn here in chapter three. So go ahead and pause if you haven't got that piece of paper and a pencil. And for the rest of us, we're going to move on and go over some of the things we've learned thus far. Some of these things as I read them, you might be thinking like, well, of course that's the way it is. But if you think all the way back to chapter one, these were probably some things that you didn't know to start off chapter one. So the first couple concepts that we got out of chapter one were that species are going to inherit their body structures from their ancestor populations. So as a reminder, we also learned what that word structure was, and those are all different types of body parts from limbs to nostrils to skull shapes. All of those are different types of structures. The second thing that we started to learn about was that importantly and very importantly for us is that those body structures are really what we use as evidence that two different species are evolutionarily um, common ancestors, meaning that they are related. So that's super huge. That was a lot of what we learned in chapter one. And of course, at this point, this stuff, like I was saying, probably seems pretty obvious to you. In chapter two, we started to figure out which of these animals our mystery fossil was most related to. We also learned that not only is it structures that help us to understand where the relations um, are most closely aligned, but some of the ways that the body works, such as uh, giving live birth, is something that's going to help us to narrow that down. If you remember at the start of chapter two, we learned that our mystery fossil uh, was actually pregnant, and there was a second fossil that was found inside of the first fossil which helped us to know that crocodiles would be a species that we could eliminate because they don't give live birth. They uh, give birth by laying eggs. So what we started to talk about was how did whales, wolves, and that mystery fossil become so different? Because even though they are related, they are different. The main reason that they are so different is that populations tend to get separated into different environments. Natural selection, which those of you who have already completed that Amplify unit on natural selection are going to have a little more background knowledge on this. But natural selection causes different changes to a population um, over time, and that each of those two populations in two different environments are going to end up with differences in their shared structures that they may have had in the past. You can think back to our reading on the Galapagos tortoise or on the polar bear, and those are two organisms that had some different structures based on some changes in the environment. So we talked about the polar bear and the Galapagos tortoise, but it's also something that can happen that's evolutionarily important, is that if the environment stays stable, that was a vocab word from chapter two, and st stability or something is stable, that means that it's not really changing. And some of those species um, can stay the same if their environment doesn't change. Whereas other changes are gonna occur for species that do have changes in their populations. Lastly, a big, very important concept to always keep in mind when we're thinking through this is that these changes happen over a long period of time. They happen over millions and millions of years. They're not big changes. They're small little things that add up to create different species. And they are things that end up making large differences that even though we might not notice them at first, little differences can all add up over millions and millions of years. So finally, before we get going here, just wanna remind you of what our mystery fossil is gonna look like. And then going back to what we really need to dial in for this final unit, because a fossil is about to go on display. We want to make sure in that museum that it's in the correct display. So as paleontologists in this final unit, we've got to figure out, is that mystery fossil most closely related to a whale or is it most closely related to 
a wolf. So we're gonna dive into that today. Um, I hope that review is helpful for you to kind of ground yourself in what we know so far. So as we go forward throughout this unit, um, you're gonna be able to remember some of that stuff that we've learned so far. So speaking of things that we have learned, we're gonna get into a warm up where as scientists, I always try and remind my students that it's okay to not know everything. And what we want to try and do is we want to try and push ourselves to predict or create hypotheses and question what's going on. So we went over things that we did know already. Now in the warm up, I'm gonna push you to use your brain to think about some things that you have not learned. And it's gonna be more of a prediction that you're gonna be making. And you're gonna be making predictions based on these two evolutionary trees over here. We've got one evolutionary tree that has one branch that's split into two descendant species. And then as more and more time goes on, those descendant species actually have a split in their uh, population. And there are two species that branch off of each of them. So then there are four different species moving forward. So based on this warm up, what you're going to be thinking about is which group of descendant species is most likely to have body structures that are different from this ancestor population. So really focusing in on this one, which species do you think is going to be most different from our ancestor? And then secondly, it's going to ask you to focus in on descendant species B and think about which is going to have body structures that are most similar to species D. So go ahead and pause the video now. Again, don't feel like you have to know this answer perfectly, but I wanna push you to get as detailed of an answer as possible. And as long as scientists, as long as we are explaining our thinking, it is always okay to say we don't know something, but to explain what we think is happening, because we do have some pretty good background knowledge at this point. So go ahead, Pause the video, answer these two questions, and then we will join back up to start the rest of our lesson together. So here we've got our chapter three question. And hopefully you got some time to really dig into that warm up, which is gonna perfectly lead into our chapter three question because we've got those different branches on those evolutionary trees. Our chapter three question is gonna ask us, how can we tell if the mystery fossil is more related to wolves or whales? That's what we're going to be deciding. Last chapter, we learned that that environment is going to have an impact. Well, that's great, but we need to figure out what, uh, where these fossils go in our museum. So today, as we get started, a key concept that's gonna be important for us is that among three species, so this again ties a little bit into what you were thinking in your warm up. The two species that are separated most recently are the most closely related to one another. And I just wanted to go over this word relationships because you probably have heard about this in talking about different family members, right? Brothers and sisters are more closely related to each other than they might be to their cousins. So that's similar. And if you've seen a family tree, you may have even noticed already as you're going through this and made a connection to our evolutionary trees are pretty similar to what a family tree um, or sometimes what we call in science a pedigree chart might look like. So what that means, let's get a better visual for it. It means that among three species, the two that are most closely separated are most closely related. So the thing that I think most people get confused on the most is you might think that, oh, okay, all of these species A, B, C, and D, they're all color-coded orange. They must be related. Well, actually, no. Species C is more, much more closely related to descendant species D than it is the species A. Because if you think about how far it has evolved from this original split, there's been bunches of changes that are gonna make it look probably pretty different than species C. So keep that in mind, the closer they are together on the tree, um, by these connections, we can't just go, oh, well, species C is close to species B, they must be really closely related. You've got to look at the connections here and trace among this along this line to see which are most closely related. So that's going to help us today as we go into looking at our model. We've used some different simulations and we've used some different models. And today we're going to be using a hands-on model and we're going to be using some connects. So 
Uh, it's going to be a new thing. You maybe have used these in a different class before, but as we get started here, what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to create that t, a t chart to help us kind of track some of our thinking. So I'll draw out the t chart. Feel free to draw along with me, um, making sure that if you start to get behind, uh, just pause the video and then you can get caught up and restart it. I always like to draw, start by drawing my horizontal lines, and I drew my line pretty straight. Your line doesn't have to be perfectly straight. I have some students that love to make their lines perfectly straight. Um, and as long as it's not crazy crooked and going all the way across your page, that is totally fine. As long as you have the correct number of boxes, you're going to be set up and good to go. So you've got those three lines drawn. The last piece that you're going to want to create here are some headings. So I'm just going to kind of highlight those for you. These headings you want to create up at the top. The first one says only species H and I have this structure. Second one says only species J and K have this structure. And finally, we have only species H, I, J, and K have this structure. So I know that was pretty fast. You might not have gotten all that written down. So feel free to just kind of listen and continue to write. I want to be real clear before we get into our model that models are not the real world. Unfortunately, in my house, I don't have a bunch of different living live species to show you over millions and millions of years. But what I do have is I do have some uh, representations of what those species might look like that we're going to be using with our connects here. So those are going to be what we use today. And when you hear me say species H or species I or species whatever, it's not talking about an actual living organism, but it's talking about one of these connect models that are going to help us as we go through and learn today about how closely related these different things are. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to be moving on. If you need another second or two to get that T-chart completed, that is 100% okay. Just pause the video and get that taken care of for yourself. This, though, is going to be what we use for our model today. So you can see that our timeline here is starting 60 million years ago and goes all the way up to 10 million years ago. And we just started to write down in that T-chart, species H, I, J, and K. Well, you might be wondering, why are we starting with these that are the most recent? Some of the times people think, well, we should probably be starting with uh, A over here because that's the very first one. Well, what you're gonna see is as we are figuring out what structures these species have in common, we're gonna be using that to work backwards. It's pretty hard to just start here and then start to go through and figure out what it had, which is why together, we're gonna to start to think about what are the exact similarities between H and I, what are the similarities between J and K, and then what are the things that they all have in common? That's gonna help us work back to determine what species F, and what species G might look like. So. Let me take a second to get my species or my little connects ready, and then we'll start to talk about those similarities here in just a moment. All right, so here we have, I have broken it down for us so that you can just use the visuals up here. Um, but then I also have some of the live models that unfortunately, I wish you could kind of tab these and play around with them at your house or wherever you might be. Um, but we don't have that, uh, that technology yet for me to send these to you through the video. So we're going to take a look at these two things together. And our first column we're going to notice says, what are the things that only H and I have um, in common? So as we start to take a look at these two things, we are going to start to notice that there's some different blue rods. Um, we've got some of these yellow half circles. We've got the white circles. But the things that H and I only have that we're going to get started with here is that, well, H and I only, thinking about J and K over here, um, they only have the blue uh, rods that are similar. And then they also have these yellow half circles that are similar. So you're going to want to make sure that you add that into your chart. Notice that 
this keyword only tells me that um, even though they do have these white circles in common, we're going to get to that in a second because this is something that uh, also are in common with J and K, not something that's exclusive only to H and I. So go ahead and get that written into that first table. Remembering to pause as you need to, it's totally okay to pause the video and that's really a good way um, to make sure you're learning with these videos. Strong learners, when they're watching videos, pause when they don't understand and they rewind. J and K, so let's take a look at J and K. I'm gonna grab those. Again, I wish I could virtually send these to you so that you could play around with them at home. We've got J right here and then we've got K here. So if we start to think about the things that they have in common, well, we've got these white rods, okay? And then they also have these gray pieces in common. Those are things that are completely unique to J and K, things that H and I don't have. So in that middle T chart, we wanna write in that we've got these white rods and we've got these gray pieces, which are kind of a hard shape. So I just ended up calling them pieces. If you have a better way to describe those, you should go for it. Um, they're kind of like a weird corner angle piece. So now we've thought about those unique structures of each of these things. The next thing that we're going to wanna do is think about all of these. What is the thing that they all have in common? And we save this one for last. Um, and not because it's the hardest, you've hopefully already started to realize this, but the thing that they all have in common is they all have white circles. So as we start to continue into our, uh, let me just go back here so you can see it. As we start to go into this, that's gonna help us work backwards to determine what species F and what species G are going to look like. So start to think about that for yourself based on what we saw here in our table. What do you think species F and species G are going to look like? What are some of those structures that we can use in terms of our commonality here that might tell us a little bit about that? So I'll have you pause the video and kind of think that over. You might want to write it down if that's a way that you like to think best. But just start to think about that before we reveal what they are going to look like. All right, hopefully you got a second to think for yourself what they're going to look like. Um, and now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna model the thinking that you're going to uh, use that's gonna help you to continue to think about what might this common ancestor species look like uh, species F here based on H and I. And the thinking that I'm going to use is I'm going to start to think about, well, what are the things that they have shared in common? Because as they branch off of F and as they become a descendant, they might develop new structures. They might develop some new, cool, unique traits. But things that I know F is going to most likely have are going to be things that both of these two species have. Now, there's a couple different answers that you could come up with with this, but what I'm gonna start to notice is that F is most likely gonna have that white circle. That's really clear. In fact, every single one of our species have that. But the important thing is that these two species have that. The other thing that I'm noticing is that they all have blue rods, but H and I don't have the same number of blue rods, but they do both have one that's sticking straight out. So I'm gonna kind of ignore this part of H because that's unique and that might have evolved as that descendant species may have gone into a new environment where it needed that extra limb um, in order to survive. I like to think about these pieces sticking off as limbs because even though these aren't species, they are a model and limbs are things that come off of our bodies. So I've got kind of that white circle, I've got a yellow rod. And then if I notice both of these actually do have that yellow semicircle or half circle connecting them. So hopefully you can tell that most likely those, since they share those uh, different structures, that's something that we could predict that species F is most likely going to look like. So now if you were able to think through and think about, wow, and you got the same thing before we started this video, that's awesome. But what I want you to try and do now, um, we're gonna think about G here in a second. Pause the video, use that same type of thinking and think about what would G look like? Maybe you even wanna write a quick sketch on your piece of paper, but pause now and think that over for one or two seconds. 
Okay, so if you were looking at some of these common structures, hopefully what you noticed was we've got that common center white piece. That part was pretty easy. Then what we've also got is we've got these two white pieces sticking out. Okay, so that's what I end up going with for what my uh, species G was going to look like. You may have had one additional piece in there, um, but mine didn't include that. So think about maybe uh, what yours was and if it, if it was a structure that was shared here, that's totally okay. This is just one option that you could have went with for your answers for species G. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna continue to work our way all the way back to species A. So now hopefully you're getting in a rhythm here and figuring out what exactly we are doing here to identify what that common ancestor species might look like based on the branches that we've got. So think about for yourself, what do you think species A is going to look like? And then resume the video once you've gotten a second to Think about it, jot it down, write down what you think it's gonna look like, or maybe even make a sketch of it. All right, here we are, species A, the species that started it all. Really, really simple, right? But we can see over time that because A and C had that similar structure of that white circle, that over time we're starting to get some pretty diverse looking life out there in the world with these models of H, I, J, and K. So now that we've gotten some time to think about that sim, we're gonna go into a new modeling tool that's going to challenge your thinking in a different way and use some different looking species. So if you do have access to Amplify, I wanna encourage you to open up lesson 3.1, open up that modeling tool and maybe think through it for yourself. If you don't have access to that, that's totally okay. Continue to watch the video and we're gonna work through it together. But remember, anytime you push yourself to think independently, you're gonna be getting uh, a little bit more learning maybe out there than some of us and really pushing yourself and maximizing your opportunities to become a stronger scientist. So I'm gonna get that model set up and then we'll meet back together here in a second to go over some of the discoveries we can make within that model. All right, here we are in the modeling tool. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be starting to try and think in a different direction that we thought in the last model um, to kind of plan out what these different species are going to look like. So what I want to do here to start is that we are going to have the option of selecting whether or not we've got a common ancestor or a descendant species. Remember the thing that starts at all is that ancestor species. So I'm going to go ahead and call uh, click on ancestor population. And then this one's a little bit tricky and you would probably be able to go with either of those because it is a common ancestor for the two that go here. But for right now, I'm gonna label it as a descendant species and I'm gonna label the rest of these as a descendant species because they are all going to be species that are going to be descending from uh, our species A right here. So, we're gonna to start to work on this first branch and what we're gonna be thinking about is what are some of those structural changes that are happening. Now, if we look here, we've got a couple X's. It's got a spine or a vertebrae. It's got a skull, we've got nostrils, we've got a front limb, but not a lower limb. And we don't really have a tail here. So if I look at species B, I'm gonna observe, ah, there's only one X. Pretty easy to notice here that we are, our new structure that this species has introduced is this back limb. So I'm gonna go ahead and click. I'm gonna click on that back limb. And then I've got that set up to show that that back limb is our new structure as we move forward. So as we continue to think about these, uh, the next two species that I'm going to have here, we're gonna be looking for species that have similar structures, meaning they're going to have two limbs, um, but they might have some other unique, new, different changes. So if I look over here, what I'm gonna start to notice is that I do have a species here, and you gotta kinda look carefully, because when I first looked at these, I was like, species C looks exactly the same as species B. Maybe something's wrong. Well, if you look closely, what is actually happening here is that we've got that hind leg. I'm gonna drag species C here because I'm noticing that it has two limbs, 
spine, uh, skull, and that it doesn't have a tail. But what we've started to see change is that that front limb actually shrunk. So adding things is not always something that is going to be an evolutionary thing, but things may be shrinking or becoming smaller or leaving that species entirely could be another option. Now, as I look at these two, I'm gonna check out species D. Well, species D does not have a uh, back limb and all of a sudden it has a tail and that's a lot of changes. So I'm gonna kind of move on to E and hope that E matches a little bit the thinking here. So what I notice is uh, first thing is good. It does not have a tail which matches species B. It's common ancestor and is mo more similar. And then if I drag this in here, get a little bit closer, we're gonna notice that those back limbs still look the same. And then my front limb, instead of shrinking this time, has grown larger. So we can use process of elimination now to drag species D into that final spot. And then species D, we're gonna think about the new structure that it developed was a tail. So that kind of shows you how we can move forward uh, or we can move backward. Both are really good techniques. We've done both so far today. Really what we wanna be focusing on thinking about is finding those similar structures because that's gonna either tell us about what's gonna happen in the past, what happened in the past, or what's gonna happen in the future. So we're about ready to wrap up this lesson. So I'm gonna pull up the slide so that you can answer just a few summary questions and then we're one step closer to being done with the lesson for today and ready to move on to lesson 3.2. So here's some follow-up questions that I want you to think about. And we do have a screenshot here of what we ended up going with with our modeling tool. This is the last question that you're gonna be answering in the lesson before you complete your final question for today. Um, so from species C, D, and E, which out of those three are most closely related? And as you're answering this, don't forget, as a scientist, you want to be able to explain your answer. What is the why behind why you are saying that? How do you know that those two species are going to be most closely related? So go ahead and pause now before we get into our last slide so that you can kind of wrap up your thinking for the day and ground yourself so you can be ultimately successful on our wrap up here. All right. So if you didn't pause to answer that last question with the modeling tool, shouldn't have taken you very long, but go back and make sure you are doing that. Uh, super important that we make sure that you have answered those questions because now we've got a whole new model. So you're gonna be taking all the thinking that you learned today and translating that into a new thing that you've never seen before. Remember, we use Connects as a model. We use more of a real life model in that last modeling tool. Um, but these two models show the evolutionary process of some things that we're going to consider as unique individual species. They both start with species E and then have similarly named species as they go throughout that evolutionary tree. You're going to need to think about, based on what we know in those similarities and how they're passed down from a common ancestor population to a descendant species, which model do you think is correct? That one you can answer really easily. You can just say model one, model two. Don't need any explanation for that one. But this is where it's most important to show me your thinking. Explaining the differences between model one and model two that helped you to understand which model was actually correct. That demonstrates that you got everything you needed to know out of this lesson today. So spend some time on this wrapping up and finishing the lesson strong and i'll see you next time when we start lesson 3.2 thanks for watching the video and take some time to push yourself to be your best as you finish up this wrap up see you later